Good morning. I'm Newell Williams, president of Bright Divinity School. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this most unusual minister's week. In the past, I have greeted you from the chancel of University Christian Church. This year, I am in my study at home, a space that I have appreciated this year more than ever before. I could have greeted you from my office at Bright, which I visit a few times every week. But I figured that many of you might also be attending Minister's Week this year from your home. This Minister's Week is not only unusual in its location, but also in the lineup of speakers. Normally, one of our Minister's Week speakers is a member of the Bright Faculty. This year, nearly every one of our speakers, from persons moderating conversations to preaching, has a direct connection to Bright or TCU. From faculty members to students, alumni, staff, members of the Bright Board of Trustees, and there is one uh, who is who is not a Bright uh, faculty member, graduate, or student, but is married to a Bright student. The format is also different. More panels and not as many lectures. Our topic is caring for a hurting world. I don't think we could have a more timely topic. Hopefully, we are beginning to see the beginning of the ending of the COVID-19 pandemic, but the hurting is not over. My thanks to Dr. Eileen Teelig, who has conceived and has organized this event. I believe that this will be a very helpful Minister's Week. That said, next year, opening worship with the TCU Choir in the Sanctuary of University Christian Church. Welcome to Minister's Week 2021. Clergy and laity, horn frogs and friends, on behalf of Texas Christian University, welcome to Minister's Week 2021. I am Reverend Lee McCracken, Associate Chaplain and Interim Church Relations Officer. And TCU is again pleased to partner with Bright Divinity School and University Christian Church to present inspiring worship, thought-provoking lectures, and enriching workshops to build the Church of Jesus Christ and Christ's people. As is the case across church and culture, Minister's Week looks different this year. But our prayer is that the Spirit continues to move wildly and freely. And you and those you serve will receive the same valuable content. We are particularly excited about the theme because we recognize the many challenges and opportunities in our communities regarding matters related to this pandemic as well as white supremacy, and the value of the church learning how to minister in those various contexts. TCU is not removed from these challenges. And I am pleased to say that as a result, the university continues to learn and to respond. Chancellor Victor Buscini rightly says that connection is a hallmark of TCU's culture. And through the pandemic, we are connecting with one another in new and various ways. In my own ministry, I've enjoyed connecting with our disciple students virtually on Zoom, in this chapel, socially distanced, on blankets spread across this beautiful campus. And besides the day-to-day -day programming, our connections are taking us even deeper. TCU, by charge of the Chancellor and the Board of Trustees, is intentionally exploring matters of race, of white supremacy, through our diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives, and the Race and Reconciliation Initiative. So friends and colleagues, I pledge that TCU is not simply here as a sponsor. TCU is here, listening and learning alongside you. May God bless you, and may God bless Minister's Week 2021. So on behalf of University Christian Church here in Fort Worth, it is my privilege to welcome you to this year's Minister's Week. 
My name is Russ Peterman. I am the senior minister here. And for 80 years, UCC has partnered with Bright Divinity School and with TCU to host this incredible event. And in that time, we have welcomed to our pulpit some of the finest preachers in the church and heard some amazing scholars. But also in these halls, equally if not more importantly, countless friendships have been renewed, relationships developed, the call to ministry clarified and reaffirmed. Needless to say that like you, we are deeply disappointed that we can't gather together in person this year. And I suspect that if your ministry is anything like mine, that you need an event. You need these connections, these conversations with, with friends and colleagues, as well as with God. You need that more this year than ever before. But yet I'm thankful for Bright and for TCU for ensuring that we have this option of meeting online. The topics and the issues that we will be wrestling with are incredibly pertinent and timely to this difficult time that we find ourselves in. And I'm looking forward, as I know you are, over the next couple of days to experiencing some rich worship and engaging conversations. And my hope and my prayer is that you will receive exactly what you need, what your soul craves, what your spirit is longing for. And we will look forward to welcoming you back to these hallowed halls again next year, where we can once again be together in one another's presence. Until then, be well, be safe, and be loved. Good morning. I'm the Reverend Deborah Morgan Stokes, the senior pastor at East Dallas Christian Church, which happens to have the honor of being one of the sponsors of the Wells Sermon Series each year. Dr. L.N.D. Wells, for whom this sermon series is named, arrived in Dallas to begin his ministry at East Dallas Christian Church in November of 1922. That was just four years after the previous pandemic that hit our globe. Yet there is no information in our archival materials that shows how that pandemic impacted East Dallas Christian Church, nor how it impacted Dr. Wells as he served in his previous ministry in Ohio before coming to Dallas. He did experience another global disaster, however, with the stock market crash of 1929. Many of EDCC's members lost their jobs or had their income severely curtailed. But Dr. Wells continued to challenge the congregation with his mantra, as much for others as for ourselves. What is in our archival? files is that during those years of the Great Depression, almost 900 people in the greater Dallas area were fed and clothed by our outreach ministry of our congregation. That legacy continues even to today through the ministry of our church in this most recent global disruption, as I know it has been in your congregations also. We have all been challenged to care for a hurting world, our hurting communities outside of our own church circles. I believe that Dr. Wells would be gratified that this year's Wells Sermon Series draws upon the voiced experiences of those pastors who have directly wrestled with the call of Christ at this time that has been so challenging for all of us. Finally, I do want to share with you all that Dr. Wells's namesake, Leonard Nathaniel David Wells III, passed away right before Christmas of health reasons unrelated to COVID. I hope you remember the Wells family as they continue on their journey of grief, as we are remembering so many families this year who are making the same journey. There is so much hurt that needs to be cared for. And may we all be blessed 
as we continue to follow our call in Christ Jesus. Be blessed, my brothers and sisters. Good morning. In addition to the greetings from others, I'd like to add my own this morning and tell you it's my joy to welcome you to Ministers Week 2021. As with the rest of the world, Ministers Week has a new look and feel this year. Planning for this event begins months in advance. And as the world changed around us, the question we kept coming back to over and over again is what do pastors, chaplains, and agency leaders need? What would be most helpful to you at this time? Of course, the answers to those questions changed as we all had to pivot to new ways of doing ministry and then settle into the long haul. As social, economic, and racial injustices were highlighted and we turned to the work of anti-racism. As divisions grew sharper and wider in our country and we are still trying to figure out our part in knitting people and communities back together again. And of course, overlaying all of that was death, grief, exhaustion, isolation, and caring for family and friends. So what is it that you need? How can this time over the next two days be of help to you? We hope that somewhere in the sermons, the panel discussions, the lecture, and the times to connect with each other through conversation, you will find ideas, support, and if it is not too much to ask, inspiration for the incredibly difficult and crucial work you do. So as we begin a word about logistics, each day, today and tomorrow, there is one link for you to access all of the plenary events, but it is a different link for each day. So if you have not yet registered for tomorrow, please do so. So that one link works for all the plenary sessions, but when we get to the time for conversations, what we're calling connecting through conversation, you can choose whichever one you want to join, which sounds the most interesting to you. These will be happening over Zoom meeting, and the links to those conversations are found on a secure website for Bright. Both the, the link to that website and the password were contained in the reminder emails that you received yesterday and this morning. The password is case sensitive, and it's very easy. It's capital M, capital W, 2021. So be sure and look for those uh, for the, the conversations. And with that, I think we will get started. Welcome again. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us for Ministers Week 2021. It is my pleasure to introduce our preachers who will be delivering Wells sermons. First, the Reverend Dr. Irie Session, who serves as the co-pastor at The Gathering, a womanist church in Dallas, Texas. Dr. Session is a spiritual entrepreneur, preacher, teacher, author, and coach. From her early days being raised in public housing in New York City, she developed a passion for social justice and love of theology that helps marginalized persons discover and reclaim their unique voices and value. Dr. Session holds a Bachelor of Science in Social Work from Oklahoma Christian University, a Master of Divinity with a Certificate in Black Church Studies from Bright Divinity School, and a Doctor of Ministry from Colgate Rochester Crozier Divinity School, specializing in transformative leadership and prophetic preaching. She's the author of Murdered Souls, Resurrected Lives, and Badass Women of the Bible. For more information, check out her website at dririe.com. Dr. Irie will be ministering to us today with a sermon entitled, Who Cares? which is a meditation on Isaiah chapter 50, verses four through nine, following Holy Week of year B of our liturgical calendar. Welcome the Reverend Dr. Irie Session.
Good morning. Our preaching passage comes from Isaiah chapter 50, verses 4 through 9a, and I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. And the text reads like this. The Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher, that I may know how to sustain the weary with a word. Morning by morning, God wakens, wakens my ear to listen as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I did not turn backward. I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from insult or spitting. The Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint. And I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand together. Who are my adversaries? Let them confront me. It is the Lord God who helps me. Who will declare me guilty? All of them will wear out like a garment. The moth will eat them up. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for this preaching moment. Be with those who hear your word. May it fall on open hearts and listening ears. In Jesus' name, amen. Join me for just a few minutes as I preach from the topic, Who Cares? During this pandemic, sometimes I watch Netflix and chill. On one occasion, I binge watched a series called The Wild. It's a story about a group of teenage girls who thought they were heading to a retreat, but who were actually on their way to a deserted island as a social experiment. While on the plane, a drug that rendered the girls unconscious was slipped into their dessert. Several hours later, they awoke in the middle of the ocean floating on debris. Seeing an island in the distance, they swam to its shore. One of the girls, prior to boarding the airplane, had taken a nasty fall. There was a young man who witnessed her fall, and because of the impact, he suspected she might have internal damage. So he suggested she not take the flight. He was concerned about her and wanted to make sure she was okay. But she insisted on taking the flight anyway without getting herself checked out. If only she had heeded the young man's keen insight. After several days on the island, the girl died. On the outside, she appeared normal and healthy. Inwardly, though, she was bleeding, her organs slowly shutting down. She was sick, hurt on the inside, but didn't know it. Beloved, we live in a hurting world, and it's been hurting a long, long time. There are those who've been unable or worse, unwilling to recognize the extent of the world's hurt or even its reality. But on January 6th, we witness with our very own eyes the truth. We're bleeding internally as a nation. Now, to be clear, that wasn't the first time we'd seen it. We saw it in the genocide of indigenous peoples. We saw our internal bleeding in the enslavement of African peoples. We saw again, we saw it again in the destruction of reconstruction. Our internal bleeding was also televised. We saw it in the vicious attack dogs and water hoses on black bodies. We saw our internal bleeding uh, on the neck of George Floyd and on the sleeping body of Breonna Taylor. But on January 6th, our internal bleeding, visible for all the world to see, shut down our government. And still some refuse to see it for what it is. We live in a hurting world. And so did the prophet Isaiah. See, Isaiah was called to care for a hurting world, and he was equipped with what he needed to do just that. How many of you know and believe that where God guides, God also provides? God provided Isaiah a proclamation. The prophet was given the tongue of a teacher, the Bible says, literally a discipled tongue. Isaiah's strategy of care, his strategy to stop the internal bleeding of his people, was in his proclamation. It was in the words he spoke, the words given him by God. Proverbs 25 reminds us of the transformational power of the right word at the right time. 
the Bible says a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in a setting of silver. Like a gold ring or an ornament of gold is a wise rebuke to a listening ear. The prophet teaches us right here in this text that as ministers, we have the surgical tools needed to stop the internal bleeding. We have what's needed to care for the world's hurt, the prophetic proclamation of the preacher. The word that comes to us in our quiet time of prayer and meditation, the word given by God as we awaken in the morning and listen attentively. To care for a hurting world, we must have courage to speak the words we hear from God. In this text, the prophet Isaiah models such courage. He preaches to a community of people who are weary. Here, weariness is the result of prolonged trouble, compounded pain, and the emotional outcome of seeing no favorable results. As ministers, we lead a people who are weary. We're weary of not seeing favorable results. We are uh, caring for a people who are weary of isolation, weary of economic uncertainty, weary of being overlooked, weary of being underrepresented, disproportionately represented, and mis represented. Our people are weary of wondering who's next in their family or friend circle to get COVID-19. The people are weary. And so what do we do? Well, to begin with, I say we confess. And, and I'll go first. I am weary. So I had to ask myself, how do I preach a prophetic word to a community of ministers and faith leaders about a prophet who preached among a people who had grown weary without first acknowledging my own weariness? See, I understand waiting for something that never happens. I understand the emotional toll of maneuvering a world inundated with troubles, voices, activities, and behaviors with one objective, to muffle the sound of the genuine of certain people. Black, brown, indigenous people, women, non-binary and transgender people. I understand trying to make sense of a troubled world where gas lighting and lies and cowardice ensure the willful ignorance of white supremacy as a clear and present threat to the democratic experiment. I am weary. I wonder if you are too. If you are, it's okay to speak it. It really is, for in confessing the truth of our own weariness, we position ourselves as colleagues and ministry partners with those we're called to care for. You see, caring for the weary requires acknowledging our own weariness. Doing so enables us to have empathy, to actually feel the pain in the world. Oh, but we don't really want to feel the pain in the world, but caring for people who are weary comes at the cost of feeling. It comes at the cost of vulnerability. The prophet Isaiah paid the cost to care. He allowed himself to be vulnerable among the people. See, to care for a hurting world, a world plagued with internal bleeding, is to risk our own vulnerability. Vulnerability puts us in danger, though. It puts us in danger of abuse by the very people for whom we're called to care. Isaiah makes it clear that by speaking the words given him by God, he became vulnerable to mistreatment. Did y'all miss it in the text? The prophet said, and I quote, I was not rebellious. I spoke the word given me by God. I gave my back to those who struck me, end quote. As ministers, we don't want to and ought not have to suffer emotional abuse at the hands of our parishioners, those for whom we care. But we know it happens, right? When we give ourselves to the ministry of Jesus Christ, uh, we risk being wounded by the very people we're sent to help. See, they, they often don't believe they need the kind of help we've been called to provide, which is most often truth telling. They don't know that they're bleeding internally, but we do. And so because we know it, we muster the courage to tell them anyway, and it costs us. What has it cost you? What has speaking truth to power cost you? Perhaps it has cost you the freedom to preach it like you feel it. Maybe truth-telling has cost you a peaceful pastorate. Perhaps it has cost you your job or your reputation or maybe even friendships. I don't know what it has cost you. I do know what it has cost me. But I'll tell you what. 
The good news is the cost to care isn't the end of the story. For I see in this text a promise, a promise that the divine presence, God's presence, will preserve and protect the prophet. Isaiah paid a cost to care, but he had blessed assurance of God's divine presence. We too can have confidence that the divine presence will preserve and protect us. Not necessarily protect and preserve us from harm, but always preserve and protect us from hell. Now, I do not use hell in the sense of an afterlife of torment. No, God's care, God's presence, God's presence preserves and protects us from an internalized hell, a hell of fear, a hell of anxiety, and a hell of worry. See, while the prophet was called to help the people, this passage shows us that there was also help for the prophet. Isaiah received divine help for himself. So when we look at our hurting world, a world suffering from internal bleeding, a world weary of waiting for something yet to happen, we can be assured that God's presence will preserve and protect us too, not from hurt not from pain, uh, not even from death, but from abandonment, from the terror of absolute aloneness. You see, we are not alone ever. While God's presence doesn't always fix it, whatever it is, God will be with us in it and through it, walking with us, journeying with us, comforting us, however God chooses to comfort us. Somewhere in the Bible, it does say that God is the source of all comfort and comforts us in all our troubles. Do you believe it? See, to care for a hurting world is to accept the reality that yes, there will be trouble, but even in trouble, God is there. And God's divine accompaniment has to be enough because it's our ultimate promise. God will be with us. So rest and continue to care. Recharge and continue to care. Take care of yourself and continue to care. And remember, you are not alone. God's presence is our guarantee that no matter how dark the night or how dismal the day, we are not abandoned. We are not alone ever because God cares. Who cares? God cares. Thank you, Reverend Dr. Irie Session, for that sermon. We'll take a short break now, and we will be back here the same link at 10 o'clock. See you then.